says we're live. Okay, I think um, I think we are live. Um, I just want to check one other thing. Um, just a quick housekeeping to everyone. Um, for the people who are not speaking, um, if you can keep your cameras off so that um, Pauline, the host, and the presenter can be live at the can be on the screen at the same time, that would be good. When it's your turn to speak, um, same thing. You'll put the camera on, and who's not speaking, your camera will be off. Thank you. One more thing, Pauline, I just need to check one more thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're good. If uh, Pauline, let me know if you're hearing any echoes or anything like that, but I think we're good. I'm good. I'm be ready to start. Mm -hmm. So Marley, Sue, you, you you're hitting it. You're hitting it off. <laughs> Which is quite different. Um, thank you everyone for joining um, this session of uh, Book It um, on this beautiful summer day in most places, I should say. Um, I'm just going to take a brief minute and introduce uh, Dr. Pauline Beard, um, who is from Buxton, Guyana, and has done an amazing job of being the cultural bearer of our stories um, in Guyana and Buxton. Um, and she does it in an amazing way using our Creolese, which is excellent. Um, it's a language that we want to keep alive. Um, Dr. Pauline also is um, an accomplished author. Um, several books, but I will just um, highlight our most recent, which is Dave and the Lime Tree. Um, this particular book focuses on um, STEM and introducing young people to STEM. Um, and Pauline continuously do an amazing job of ensuring a platform is provided for all um, up and coming authors and established authors, especially those from Diana. And with that, I will turn it over to Pauline. Thank you very much, Marlies. I'm not used to this formal introduction on Book It, but everybody, wherever you are in the world, welcome and good morning. Um, good evening. It's morning in Japan where I am and it's nice and bright outside. Book It is an event where we, we host a Guyanese author, at least for now. Um, so that they can share their works with people and we celebrate the author. It started because um, people started sending me their books and I'm a reader and a writer. I'm always booking it. That's why I call this thing book it. And so here we are with our um, guest tonight. I'm going to invite someone to pray and we begin. Bonnie, is that you? Yes, yes, indeed. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for moments like these when we can gather together to engage in ways that are not usual and common to everyone. We thank you for allowing us the opportunity to provide this event, and we ask your blessings. Thanks for all those who are going to, who are with us and will be joining us as we go along. We pray and ask that this will be very informative and our discussion will be such a fine one that it will energize others and encourage others along the way. We pray this prayer in the name of God. Amen. Amen. To start it off, we are going to have Dr. Kwesi Ojinga doing a poem for us called Chiseled. This poem, Chiseled, is written by uh, Dr. Dalston Morian. That's the man of the moment today. Uh, it says, when your joys have taken flight, and no one understands you are being chiseled in. When from the stage of life, no one cheers for the song you have sung, you're being chiseled. When your dream is born to ash and you feel the pain and loss, oh, you are being chiseled. When your purse is empty and you're dusted into poverty, you are being chiseled. When from the mountaintop, you're being dashed to a valley low. You are being chiseled. 
but all the night your net is cast and no catch you come to know. You are being chiseled, but when you know for sure that your master's in control, you don't worry about being chiseled for he is working through every trial, test and loss. Tis he that allows you to be chiseled. So just wait a moment longer, be still, he'll make you stronger for he still holds in his hands the chisel. It is own way. He's chipping away all stubble from the clay. Remember, it's God that works the chisel. And when his work is done, and he refines you as a son, you'll be glad to know you were chiseled. He meant no harm and was doing his best with you while you were being chiseled. You will praise him more with a wonder of love and exhale the day you've been chiseled. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's the maestro, <laughs> the thespian, Dr. Kwesi Ojinga. That's it. Kwesi, you brought it to the today. Nice. I love it. You were being chiseled. Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> so friends and family, we're here with Dr. Dawson Morian, with whom we call Bonnie Morian, Bunny. So now and then if I slip and say Bonnie, it's no disrespect. I go back all the way to Guyana with this young man as a Guyanese, um, a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a master guide, Asian stars, wherever you are, big up yourself and so on. And so Bonnie is here today, Dr. Morian, to share with us his book and for us to celebrate him. The book is called Out of the Crocox Bag. Guyanese, yeah, I know the Crocox Bag, right? And for those who don't know the Crocox Bag, the Crocox Bag is what we call a jute bag, where you carry the coconut inside and so on. When we were young people growing up in the village, we used to sleep on Crocox bag. Yes, all of us who is Dr. So and Dr. So, it's Crocox bag we sleep on. So we come from very humble beginnings. And so I want to begin. Um, yes, um, let me go to the first things I want to ask you. Um, T tell us a little bit about yourself because our audience may not know much about you. Um, where you're from, something about your background, any defining moments in your journey so far? Because it's been a while since we've seen each other face to face. So take it away. Thank you, um, Dr. Pauline, for uh, Dr. Baird, for the opportunity of being with you and for, for the privilege of having this conversation with you. It's a long story and I'm glad that um, this is what your platform is all about, telling stories and talking about times past. <laughs> um, when it comes to me, um, in terms of my, uh, my life, I was born in um, the northwestern part of Guyana, um, now contested by the Venezuelans, and um, in a place called Mabaruma. I spent some time that that's where I was born. I do not know how long I, um, we lived in that area to, to get my other brothers and my mother and father. But then eventually I found myself in Linden. And I was told that we lived in Linden for a while, but most of my life after removing from Linden, moving from Linden, I found myself with my family in Burbis, Belladrum, the district of Belladrum, but to be more exact, the village of Golden Fleece. And um, Golden Fleece is quite an interesting place economically. Um, nothing much to do, subsistent living. Um, you, you climb your coconut tree, you peel your coconut, you make copra, you make oil, you go to your garden, you plant your allotted um, part of land that was given to us by mom every Sunday. You had to get down there and um, everybody was allotted their part. By the time I was nine years old, my father was kind of up, but not really gone, but gone. And, um, and um, you know, we had to struggle together to make sure that ends meet within the family. 
So I had my own little plot where I had to plant my, my okros. I had my own little plot where I had to plant my peas. And all of that came together with my other, the efforts of my other brothers to make sure that we had enough food. Uh, my mother, to a large extent, was responsible for what we would say being father and mother of the house. And she did everything that she could have done to make sure that, um, you know, our four boys, four strong, um, hefty heaters um, would, keep a lot, would be kept alive. And so we were engaged as a family in a number of things for survival. We had two gardens, one at the back dam and one at the water side. Um, we had to do um, cattling. We, I had some cattle rearing that I did. My mother had a few cows and I was kind of more responsible for the cows and so on and so forth. But of course, in, in all of that, we still had some time to play some cricket and some football. And I had the opportunity of playing football at the regional level. I had the opportunity of playing cricket for my village. And most of the matches that I played in, we won them. And um, there are some elements, some notes on history of some of the things that I did when I played both football and um, cricket. Church was a part of my, big part of my life. I don't know what I would have done without church and all that came along with that. It kept me engaged. And I guess um, church's engagement and church is one of the things that keep you off the, um, the radar of society as I'm brand, being branded as a bad boy. So I was kept in line. There were some very important people that were part of my life. When it came to, comes to schooling, my mother was not sufficiently um, capable of sending me to school every day, you know, especially during the secondary school years. I was able to go to school sometimes three times a day and uh, two times a week rather. And um, I, she was not able to provide enough money for me to get on the bus. My school was 10 miles away from Belgium to Maikoni. And um, if she did not have enough money to put me in the bus, then she did not have enough money to put me out of the school. And so learning was very difficult for me. And um, yo. Can you hold a minute? I'm getting yeah. feedback. Somebody's mic is on. I, I think know. they just turned it off, uh, Pauline. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so why don't I stop you? So you are a traveler. You were a traveler. You were born in Mabruma. <laughs> I don't know if um, I should call it Bush. I call it Bush. I call it Bush. So you came from Bush to Linden to Borbies. And as you're talking, I'm getting this panoramic view of your life. The boy yeah. in the country with the big family. You know, yeah. you see that garden bed thing? That garden bed thing, I had it too. I had it too. I remember living in Buxton in the clinic compound. My stepmother was a um, midwife, I think, at the time. And we all had a little bed. Mine was cabbage and peanuts. And all, right. all my sisters and brothers had that. So we have commonalities. And those who are listening, I'm sure you can relate to this story. So you grew up, you got the church. And you were telling us that story. So let's continue. It's fascinating. Yes. And, and if you just allow me... Um entrance as a co-host, I will be able to do a few things. So we are, we're talking about church now. And um, of course, I, my life in church was quite a busy one. I was given opportunity to serve in various offices at the church. And so church was a place that pro provided me an opportunity to grow. And the more I grew, the more determined I became about, uh, you know, and um, it came to a point while going to school and going to church, struggling with studies, but yet um, kind of experiencing a sense of grounding in church. I began sensing that my aspirations for progress and success in life began growing. It was a transformational point in my life. And what compounded my desire to advance myself was the fact that there came a period of time when a number of the young people were just moving away from church and migrated. Some of them went to Cuba to study. Some of them went to America. And, you know, once a Guyanese heard that someone was moving to America, we began thinking progress in life, you know. And um, it began dawning on my mind that all my other um, compatriots, those who are of my age group, they were moving away. And some of them just a little younger than myself, they were moving away. And I was kind of left behind and I began reflecting on those kinds of things. And I began to think about my life more deeply. And I began to talk to people about them and talk about my dreams. And of course, there are some people that I just could not share my dreams with because they did not have the parallel ambition that I think I was beginning to gather for myself. And so at one point in my life, I began praying and telling God, you know, 
um, you've got to help me get out of this condition because I really wanted to grow and get better at things. And I wanted to be, um, be in a position where I can help to provide for the needs of my family, particularly my mother. I began sensing that she deserved you know, being um, the recipient of the kindness and support of her, of her children. And I purpose in my heart that I wanted to be that person. And so I began praying about my education. And here's the turning point. One day when I was um, at, uh, we were preparing for a funeral, a very prominent member of the church had died. And usually my elder, he would be the one to set me up to preach the village funerals. I didn't like going with him to village, village funerals because he would not notify me that I was the one that was going to preach. Um, but once I showed up and he was there, the people loved him so much. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church was a prominent church within the village. Everybody looked towards us when it came to bringing comfort for those who were grieving and so on and so forth. And um, I remember one day he just called me and asked me to preach. And I assumed that I did so well that um, I, I caught his attention, attention at a deeper level. And so I began preaching funerals at the church. And then one day, a prominent member of the church died, and um, he came to me and he said, this is big funeral. You would not be preaching. The president of the conference will be preaching, but I want you to do a good benediction. You know, and I felt encouraged, at least I still had a part to do with this big funeral. So the preaching was over, and it was my time to uh, do the benediction. And he sat in the front seat, and he gave me a thumbs up and a wink in the eye, which indicated it's now your time. Get, get busy and get, done, get it done. And after praying, I came to the end of that prayer and I heard this resounding amen. And I said to myself, I don't remember what I said, but it must be, it must have been something good, you know? And then when all was said and done and the funeral came to an end, I was still in church packing up and cleaning up and making sure that things are placed in the right positions and so. And while I was doing that, I saw this young handsome gentleman walking down from the front door of the church coming towards the pulpit where I was positioned. And, um, and um, the young man said to me, hello, youngster, what are you doing with your education? And I began complaining about how my mother didn't have the money and I didn't know what to do and I can't go to college and so. And he said to me, I'm giving you this card of contact, this contact card. As soon as you get permission to get into CUC, now USC, I will give you the money that you need to go to study for a year. That was a turning point in my life. And I began talking to God about those things. And then another miracle happened after, I'd re after he had given me that card. Um, I began going to the garden with my uncle. I found a job with him. And in my life, I had never seen fruitfully born tom tomato trees like those. And we did it at the time when the price was right. So every Friday and Wednesday, I was down at border markets and selling the best tomatoes and gathering the best price, sometimes $18 per pound, sometimes $20 per pound. And at that time, $20 was a lot of money, you know, all in an effort to amass a num uh, an amount of money that would take me to school. Well, that came. And then suddenly one day when I was praying, the, the, the uh, postman rang his bell on the outside of our yard. And he asked my brother who was in the yard, um, do you know a guy by the name of Dalston Morian? And he said, yes, he's my brother. And he said, I have a letter for him. And I had just spoken to my mother about my intentions of going to CUC. And she, with tears in her eyes, she said, Dalston, we don't have that money. We just have a few cows. And at some point in time, we'll just sell them. We'll build a little house and we'll live in that and wait until we die. I, I just can't do it. And I seem to have convinced her that the God that I believed in would have been able to see, see me through. So I got into the room and I was praying when the bell rang. And you know, after praying to God, the, the things that I prayed to him about that day, and then the tell of the, tell of the um, postman rings his bell on the outside, you know, I became very anxious at that moment. And so I got myself on, out, outside onto the step and my brother handed me the letter. And when I opened the letter, it was not an acceptance letter from the college, but it was an immigration certificate that allowed me to come to Trinidad. And I found that that was very interesting. And I began concluding that God was working for me and lining me up. I was so anxious. I was so, I was so excited about going to college that eventually I went to college in August just when school was closed instead of the beginning of the term. And so I found myself there um, very early and I had to find myself a job to sustain myself until school. Um, um, college got open, reopened and was ready for school. But interestingly, there were so many subplots 
that looked like miracles, well, not look like, but were miraculous experiences. Um, because the day when I left school, needing $15,000 to take care of my yearly costs for schooling in terms of tuition and, and boarding, um, I left home with 15 US dollars in my pocket, going to school, needing $15,000 to get me through, you know? <laughs> And um, traveling from my home with that $15 US dollars in my pocket, I got to the city 46 miles away. And um, I had some time in terms of being early to get to the airport. And while I was prowling around in the city, a friend of mine met me and said, you know, um, I just saw some of your cousins last night. They came in on an American flight and they are here. Why not go and see them? That's after I told them the story of my intentions for college. So I decided, okay, I have some time on my hand. I will go see them. As soon as I was getting on the bus to go to see them, they were coming off the bus, the same bus, you know? And what a joy it was. And then I explained to them what my intentions were and where I was going. And one of them out of five got her hand into her pocket and she pulled out $50 and gave it to me. She said, this is what I have right now. Take it and go. So I ended up in college with 65 US dollars. To cut a long story short, after five years, I graduated with Andrews University Standards um, with honors. And um, I walked into the business manager's office that then um, um, Gilbert jean uh, who had invited me to come to his office to deal with some financial matters with regards to my schooling. And after the chit chat, he handed me a check of 5,000 TT dollars monies that I had acquired more than was needed for the cost of my schooling. So I usually tell my friends, I went to school a pauper, but I came out a rich man. <laughs> These were very important turning points in my life. And one of the great things about it is that I'm not being able to pass all my CXC because of the limitations of my mother's ability to send me to school on a regular basis so that I can learn properly. I sat in school in classroom with guys with different, with all kinds of distinctions from CXE. And all I had was English and social studies. And I had to write the GED test so that I can um, attain to the level um, that, uh, that would see me as a permanent student, you know? But I thank God that after five years, my lowest grade was a C plus, And I didn't need to study for those. Most of my other grades, including grades for Hebrew and Greek, were most of them A, and A minus, and I, I thank God. And you know, I embrace the idea that there is no mind that is so dull that cannot be made brilliant by God. I am a mm -hmm. testimony of that. And today's showing um, qualifies that statement. And I make that statement with much humility in my heart because it's not about me, it's about what God can do with my effort. Okay, buddy, that's a big, big mouthful. Yes, and I intend to write wow. about it. What a story, everybody. You know what I heard? I heard deep yearning. I heard ambition. I heard affirmation of that yearning and that ambition. I heard opportunity, divine intervention. I heard faith. Um, faith. I, I heard, you know, um, what we call the, the chirotic moments when when things just happen in a timely manner um i can i well i think you went to america you went to cuc with more money than me oh yes if i should tell you all the story of the homelessness yes hmm. yes yes indeed yes. so um yeah so i heard that and i i can you know, validate your story because I was one of the people who taught you for the GED. You remember? <laughs> <laughs> I was a GED teacher for Bonnie. I was struggling to remember who was that person, but now was the revelation has come. <laughs> In the classroom, I'm right there. No? Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Nighttime, that was my I job. Didn't, I see. didn't thank you for that. <laughs> you better. <laughs> now I'm eternally so, grateful. <laughs> Yeah, that was my that was one of my jobs at CUC, and I taught the GED when I got there, okay, and I was a trained teacher when I got to CUC. So, it's it's a long story, but that's a really lovely story for us to begin. And you know, I like that you talk about your background and not having the requisite qualifications. Yes. To the young people who are listening, listen. 
his story is not so far from mine. And many of us, when you have a gift, God will make the room for, make room for your gifts. If you believe in God or whatever God you believe in, there's room for your gifts. And when you walk in what you want, the door will open. You have to just step out and the doors will open and stuff like that. So, um, Marty, um, um, if you'd allow it, just come to my mind that it was also um, that experience of the funeral is also compounded by the brother of the young man who did that to me. And I'm basically mm -hmm. talking about the Wilson brothers, doctors Leon Wilson mm -hmm. and Colwick Wilson. Um, after right. Leon did that to me, Colwick came to church having, um, he was on holidays, I think, and visiting, or he was just graduated from USC. And he was in the congregation the day when I preached about Noah's, um, Abraham's faith. And the punchline of the sermon was, Abraham went out following God, not knowing where he was going. And mm -hmm. at, the end of the pro, uh, at the end of the sermon, the service, he met me at the door. And he said to me, it's time you stop preaching about Abraham's faith and get your own faith. Go to college. <laughs> and I was like, how dare you? You don't understand my story. And, mm -hmm. you know, I looked at him quizzically and um, with, a, with a sense of puzzle in my countenance. How could you do that? But I think in that moment, he was trying to move me from one point to another level of maturation in my experience of preaching and living what I preach. And yeah. mm -hmm. that was an encourager, encouragement to me because it was shortly after that things began falling into place. Those, those um, very interesting experiences began following in place. And I never, I never lost sight of that thought that it's time for me to have my own Abraham experience. And that is why I left Guyana with $15 and went to college. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. We got to put a pin in it there. Um, yes. There's a number of things we got to do, some housekeeping thing. I see Patricia Hudson has a hand up, um, or she indicated. Marley's um, buddy's asking if he could get a host because you want to show something. Was it that you wanted to show something? Yes, but I, I wanted to link what we're doing here with um, a setup for Facebook. And oh, it's already live. Thanks. It's just I already put it on your Facebook. I've already put it there. Okay, great, great, great. The link is on your Facebook. Yeah. I think um, we can link what I'm doing from on my side to YouTube also. Okay, well, let your people take care of that. Um, yes. Yeah, so if basically... You the, if you make me the co-host, I can do that. Well, that's Marlies's job over there. Yes, she can do that. I think I, think I, made, I made you co-host already. All right, thanks so much. Thanks for making yes, me. Um, Yes. I'm going to go to Facebook and see if anybody is saying anything there and that I can respond to or oh. have you respond to. Okay. All right. And you can have your people look at your Facebook and see if there's any question. If you're on Facebook, you can ask questions. You can, you can do anything. Um, Sandrine is saying she loves the poem. Thank you, Dr. Oh, yeah. Morian and Kwesi. Yes, Sandrine is a, is a, you know, lifelong follower, or since I started this thing, she's there. Um, Amanda Emanuel is saying, join here. And Destiny Phillips is saying, thank you. Yeah, cool. I don't see anything else here. Um, I don't see anything on the chat either. So we will go right back into our story. Um, so we're here to talk about this book that Bonnie wrote or Dr. Morian wrote. Um, would you care to tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book and who did you write it for? Okay, um, let me say it, this, say it this way. There are a number of things that are responsible for pulling this all together. Um, I was reflecting on my life at the very early parts of my ministry. And one day I was thinking about um, students, student culture. <laughs> and one of the things that came to my mind is that as I read some of these books in preparation for um, selling them so that I can earn my scholarship to go back to school, which was one of the ways that I was helped in terms of getting me through financially to school. It dawned on my mind, and it was not a, 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 a thing of pride. It was much humility. 
because I think at that point in time, I was beginning to compare and contrast my academic gains, my academic advancement um, in light of what I was reading. And somehow it dawned on my mind. And of course, I got an encouragement in that direction from um, Dr. Dre Paul, who was one of my teachers at CUC, uh, CUC now USC, in the area of um, English one or something like that. I don't remember what the course was. But he did tell me that if you learn to write and continue to write, you will improve your writing and your intellectual capabilities will increase also. So mm -hmm. I was thinking of those experiences, that experience and the encouragement from Mr. Dre Paul. And as I read, it dawned on my mind that I could write a book. And what mm -hmm. compounded that um, thought was the fact that um, it dawned on my mind also that if I can sell somebody's book, I can write my own book and get it on the market. Mm -hmm. You know, and that for me was one of the turning points. Um, but I never followed through intentionally on it. It just probably was, it was just kept in the corner of my subconscious and was there for a while. And then one day while I was at home, I was um, just going through my library aimlessly. I was aimlessly going through my library. And um, I was searching for a book, but not any particular kind of book. I just guessed that I had some time and I'd better spend it reading. And so I stumbled into a book that was given to me by Pastor Horatius Gittins. The name of the book was Family Ministry, um, written by Diana Garland. It was a classic. <laughs> when I flipped through the pages, I became particularly interested in chapter seven. The author presented a conversation on family identity. As I read, I became engrossed with what I was reading when I suddenly, when it suddenly dawned on me that family stories, mm -hmm. those countless subplots of our lives are living things. They don't die. They are only locked away in the library of our souls and just waiting to be awakened out of sleep and mm -hmm. they can produce experiences and uh, recalls that will fascinate you as you reflect on your life. It will give you an understanding mm -hmm. about knowing where you came from, the struggles of your life, the difficulties of your life and all, all of these subplots in your life, they came together um, to, 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 to create a platform, a strong platform for you to advance in ways that um, are becoming your delight. Uh, Bunny, wait a minute. Yeah. Can you put a pin there? Yes. Um, I want to do this thing. I'm glad you said that. You know, for people, for those who don't know, I host the show called What is Story Set? And Book It is yes. an arm of that. And I begin by saying, I talk about our family histories and our traditions and whispered stories. Many people think it's a joke, but I'm not there for jokes. I talk about Buxton, but my story is not just about Buxton, it's about every village boy, every village girl, every village wherever you came from. We have those stories and we must tell them because it's a particular history we're writing, whether you're Christian, you're SDA or whoever. So I am so glad you tapped into that. And that idea or that reality gave birth to this book and who you are. Thank you so much, go ahead. Okay, so, so <laughs> it's interesting that um, you have said that because out of the experience of my life and my journey, when I look at a little boy and a little girl from the village, mm -hmm. or wherever I meet them, I see myself in them. Yes. And sometimes I wonder what is it that can emerge out of their unique circumstance and situation, which sometimes raise questions about the possibility of them coming out of where they are and get into the place where they can find their purpose and their life call. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see that in children. And that's the reason why for Anne Maria, who is a little member, she's about 10 years now, a part of one of my congregations. Um, she has become my little daughter. And um, of course, when we speak of daughter, there's another story about daughter because mm -hmm. I had one little sister and she died at age three one morning. Um, that Monday morning when myself, we, the two of us, we were going to school and uh, she made an attempt to get across the road and this car scooped her up and took her life. And wow. so ever since that day, I've been borrowing sisters. So wherever I go, I think <laughs> oh, to okay. girls oh, and uh, particularly girls, you know, um, oh, for good reasons. Sisters. And so um, Amory has become a friend of mine, very fascinating little child. And um, one day I was 
talking with her. And um, at age 10, uh, nine or 10, I began asking her about what she would like to become. And she began telling me these tiny stories and her little dreams began unfolding, you know, those childlike dreams start to unfold. And um, she said to me, uh, Pastor, I, I would like to have a guitar. I, I, I want to learn to play a guitar. And I was like, Amari, you want to play a guitar? She said, yes. Well, I got on Amazon and I got her a guitar, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when I brought the guitar to her, she said to me, it's the dream of my life. And I was like, stripped to tears on the inside of my soul that so early a little child can capture the essence and the idea and the meaningfulness of having a dream, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that has created a bond between myself and Amer Amaria. And now her brother has become my little friend. He's seven and he's asking me for things too. So I see children through that lens. And so back to the story of, the, uh, of going through my library. Um, so I read this book and unknowingly, I began understanding the power of a story. These stories of our lives are usually buried beneath the rubbles of our human experience, experiences with no one to, to strip away the topsoil and to find those rich and living deposits of minerals, mineral ores that represent the living stories, the richness of our lives. It was suddenly, it was, I was suddenly awakened rather to the importance of family stories like never before. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion that when our stories are kept alive, it allows a mother generation to find answers to questions yep. about people, questions about times, questions yes. about events, questions mm -hmm. about places. <laughs> and it also allows for you to have these experiences, these stories wrapped around the clothing of your emotions because mm -hmm. your emotions are actually tied to your experiences, um, tied to your times. Tied. It, your emotions allow you to paint your life story with the, with the appropriate colors that reflect sadness, happiness, gloomy days, happy days, days when there were nothing to eat, days when you had to trust, days when you had to make sacrifices, days that were doubtful, days that were hopeful, all of those combinations, all of those elements, all of those plot story plots, they, they form the, the whole story of your life that you cannot help but live with. However, because these stories are not told, sometimes they lay beneath the surface as dead things. And I purpose, having read what um, Diana Garland had said on storytelling, I purpose in my mind that I am going to use my stories to tell the world mm -hmm things about myself so that when I die, the next generation that comes and keep my story alive, they will read about it. And yep. so in that sense, I will not be dead. I'll be alive. <laughs> but more than that, more than that, I, I thought a little deeper as I reflected on my stories. And the question that came to my mind is, other than connecting people, because that's what the stories do, they provide a connectivity between yourself and the generation present and the gen generation to come. But other than the, 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 the stories, you know, I began asking myself the question, what else can come out of my stories that mm -hmm. will be an enhancer that will help all the persons in my encounter as I encounter them? How, how would these stories help to shape their lives? And I be, it dawned on my mind that when you read a story and you reflect on them, and I think that is what is different about my writing. I, I come to the table knowing that there are other participants who have been in the discussion, in the conversation, in the dialogue a long time ago on the, on the, on the specific subject that um, is embedded in the pages of this book, Out of the Crocker's Bag. Um, it became, I became very conscious that I can pull principles out of those stories. I, I can pull things out of those stories that can become like tools, like teaching points, like flashpoints for other people. And <laughs> since family life was, uh, has become, and is becoming more and more, the place where I think I find enough satisfaction in terms of my life calling and ministry to others, I decided that I'm going to use my stories pull out those principles and experiences out of my reflection and use them, present them 
as teaching points, learning points, flash points for experience, for other people's experience that they would be able to take along with them and to build their lives. And if that can happen with what I'm doing, then my living would not have been in vain. Right. So this book is called Out of the Crocox Bag. Yes. Tell us what that story is. You want to tell us or you want to read it or I read it or what? What is it you want to do? Maybe if you start reading it, I will be able to gather myself because I'm beginning to feel the flow of my emotion. Yes, um, I'm looking for it. Marlies, is there any question? Um, while I look for it, uh, Patricia Hudson had a hand up. I don't know if she still wants to speak. I would um, love to hear her. Yeah, and while I do that, while I get the book. Um, Hi, Dawson. I'm so happy for you. Really, <laughs> I am. And, and, and Pauline, happy to see you as well. Actually, I was, I, I was trying to, um, to applaud you when you were speaking, but my hand went up instead. But I was trying to, up to I, can, I know I can just shout through the phone. Um, yay! So I was trying to applaud you because um, hearing your story and having um, been with you at CUC, um, no, USC, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear the journey that took, to, took you that took you to CUC. So um, I was just trying to applaud you. I was so excited to hear the story and um, to see how where the, where the journey started and where it has gotten you. So I'm listening. Keep talking, guys. I yes. am appreciative, Pat. Very, very appreciative. And it's nice to have you on with us. <laughs> yes. And so, um, I, uh, Pauline in the comment, um, Colleen Holder saying, your story is truly an inspiration and solidifies my belief that God is a miracle worker who's also yes. an on-time God. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, yeah. So we have people from the village um, there and everything. This thing is evading me, but I'm going to find it. Not that one, not this one. Oh, well, maybe I can start the story. Uh, I can begin telling the story and then I can probably- I got it. Uh -oh. I, I Yes, yes. I think I got it. Um, is this here? Yes, I got it here. It begins. This is called Emotional Blisters. I got to back up a little bit. Yeah. Should we begin at Emotional Blisters? I, this story, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I so, think so, that- So Bonnie, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. okay, you I read- think, Yeah, yes. emotional blisters is a good place to start. A good place to start, yeah. And I can fill in the, the, um, the um, first notes that presents the platform for the story. Okay, um, so start, let me start there. Yes. So it begins, my small coin collection changed when my grandmother could not find our envelope containing her church offering for the harvest season. I was struck immediately with panic for I feared that all, my fi all the fingers would be pointing to me as the guilty one. A quick search revealed a collection of coins stashed away in my school bag. My family accused me of stealing the harvest envelope and the monies from the cash box in the shop. That, of course, was far from the truth, but I sensed at that moment all hell was going to break loose on me. They threatened me, promising to have my hands chopped off by my new caregiver. I pleaded for my life when my hands were placed on the meat board to be chopped off for stealing. Oh my gosh, I should have given a trigger warning here. A chill came over me when I saw the pork knife in my grandmother's hand being raised to make, a, to make real the promise of cutting off my hands for being a thief and a liar. She urged me to admit to this act of petty larceny, but I refused to confess to this falsehood. When it did not work, I was further traumatized. My grandmother promised to burn my hands in a fire from the kitchen stove. I pleaded earnestly for my life, but she showed me no mercy. I felt as though I were convicted and declared guilty without a fair trial. 
But in the face of the guilty verdict, I was resolute and steadfast to the truth of my innocence. When that threat did not work, I was promised to be thrown into a dark prison room. Again, I stood firm to what I knew was right, the truth. It was my grandmother who had taught me daily to repeat the old adage, speak the truth and speak it ever, cost it what it will. Together with what I was taught about speaking the truth, I learned the importance of being truthful in all my ways. In the words of Solomon that we were taught in church, buy the truth and sell it not. I guess my learning and my practice were too strongly bound together that one could not do without the other. I emerged from this trial, my soul trembling with fear, but unbending and firm in my innocence. I awaited the next plan. Finally, somebody in my family wrestled me into a Prokoks bag with the promise of disposing of me alive into the sea where I'll be left to die. The Krakos bag was a large burlap sack. It is also called a jute bag. What a final ultimatum to evoke from me, a twisted confession of a foregone conclusion. Deeply traumatized by a renewed fear, I began thinking of my mother, my brother, and special friends from whom I would be separated forever. Looking back, I believe that my family would never have done this to me. But with the innocence of a child, I thought that they would have executed the threat. At that moment, I felt a crippling coldness and stiffness envelop my soul as I simultaneously screamed for help, grasping for breath of life spor um, sporadically. As I was, I was so helpless and afraid. With everything within me, I gave all that I had in a final plea to awaken some compassion within them the heart of the executors of my undeserved sentence, but no one seemed to believe me. In the dark dungeon of Krokot's bag, I was bound and helpless. I began seeing my final demise approaching. I quickly started losing hope in the people who were my caregivers. There in the Krokot's bag, my mind filled with confusion, fear, and emotional madness. I began envisioning the dark traumatic death of suffocation by drowning in the overwhelming waters of the gigantic ocean, waiting not far away to engulf my soul. As this final unkind act was about to be executed from within the darkness of the crocodile's bag, I made one last desperate scream for help to save my life. Then there was a moment of silence and I was offered a quid pro quo. Someone offered me freedom from my predicament if I accepted the accusation made against me. However, the conviction of truth in my heart had superseded that power and that offer, and I chose to remain committed to my innocence. I chose truth. I lost hope in the people who had come to love me and, and I had believed in. I felt something emotionally strained, strange, stifling, rippling away, from being truthful to myself. I felt I was paying a dreadful price for honesty. Then I was lifted to the shoulder by, appointed by an appointed one to conduct the final charge. His footsteps began heading towards the direction of the sea. My little heart was pounding with pain and it felt like it was gonna burst through my chest already burning like it was on fire. My, mo my mother seemingly could no longer bear the agony of my soul anymore and brought the nightmare and ugly drama to an end when she blurted out, stop, no more of this. Get him out of the bag and let him go. Then she turned to my grandmother and said in a stern voice, he will not be living with you anymore. The humiliation was too intolerable to be prolonged. For in that moment, my mother became my Messiah and saved me from my impending doom. I came out of the bag, the Krokok's bag, drenched with perspiration, trembling with exhaustion. And it seemed like I had just completed a race of a million miles. That's it. 
Out of the Crocox bag. Wow. Yes. Somebody says here, Mary Sarah said, why you compose yourself, Bunny? Um, Mary says, Mary's a better drum girl. Hi, Mary. Big up yourself. No, girl, I'm from 28, girl. 28? Oh, yes, sorry. girl. Me know but she I better drum. miss this one. Yeah, you can't miss this one. It's this homeboy. Mary yeah. says, when I was younger, I was ashamed to share my story. As I grow older, I realize that not only is important to bring important, but it brings healing and help to others to, and help others to have a voice. Thank you for sharing so much of this book. I just can't stop reading this book. Your, true, your story is truly inspirational and a testimony of what God can do when you trust him. Now, Bonnie, back to you. Anything you want to say? Well, you know, looking back as I reflect on this story, looking mm -hmm. back, I am sensing that um, this story presents the, the, the talking point that um, filters through the entire page, all the pages of this, of mm -hmm. this material. And um, the central point that I am trying to, uh, that I have made in this book Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the central point allows me to bring you through a door into a special room of my life where there is a story of this Crocross bag. Mm -hmm. And as we sit together and listen to you reading the story as I have written it, um, this amazing subplot provides mm -hmm. one salient discussion point and that discussion point becomes the spindle for the roll off of the book. And here is it. I contend that mm -hmm. early childhood neglect causes registrations of painful emotional blots that interfere with how a child navigates their relational encounters. Mm -hmm. I look at my own self and I'm reflecting on my own experience as a child my association with others in my immediate environment, my experience with marriage, my wife, my experience with other people that I cannot avoid because they are just stuck right in the part of what I do. I have had the opportunities, uh, opportunity of encountering people who have suffered from emotional blisters mm -hmm. and they, they, they come in for intervention. They seek me out for intervention because I guess they have gotten to the point where they have accepted that there is something that I have to offer because of the years of ministry and the years of radio, family life radio program. People have heard my voice in St. Lucia. My name is almost like a family name. So when I go to the supermarket, I'm just in conversation and somebody is passing and they say, I know that voice. Is that Pastor Morian? And I'm like, yeah, you see nothing too much to the desire. That's who I am. But, but I'm beginning to realize more and more as I read, as I encounter people, as I provide help and you know, intervention, mm -hmm. I am coming to the full realization that our emotions are critical. They are bound up, or I may say that a little differently, they inform or fuel how we go about establishing our relational contact with others. Mm -hmm. So if I grew up in an environment where there was abuse leveled at me, that affects my emotions. Mm -hmm. The people that loved me, the people that cared about me, the people that used me, the people that abused me, mm -hmm. the people that marginalized me, the people who didn't pay attention when I needed it most. All of those things, all of those experiences, if not properly dealt with, and if they don't receive therapy from experiences of prayer with God and professional intervention, they interfere with how we navigate our relational encounters with others. And yeah. for me, it is important, therefore, that we pay particular intentional and deliberate attention to mm -hmm. how we do what parenting is supposed to be done. Yes. Because that's the place where you encounter your first levels or your first encounters of emotional carving. You encounter mm -hmm. them within that space. 
And if mm -hmm. there is a prevalence of ignorance, as in the case of my Crocus bag experience, there is a great possibility that people get damaged from the very onset of their lives. And as such, that individual could be robbed of goodwill and may find themselves in situations that are less than desirable in terms of how they relate to one another, how to relate okay. to others. So that for me is a critical point. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it's a very, very important thing um, to consider how we treat kids. And I dare say that when it comes to the mistreatment of kids, there's no, there are no bystanders, there are no onlookers. I feel that everyone is complicit in how children are treated. They're not by standards. So I would like to say to all those who can hear our voices here and share, please, please share this video, share this live, share it like food, share it. We have to put it into our community that abuse, child abuse is not a thing that we must tolerate. We grew up with the stories of putting people in Cocox bag. I know it. You beat children in Cocox bag. People, as I can say, Taylor, stop it. Stop it right now. If you see somebody do it, intervene. It's your job. You can't say, well, I ain't got nothing for the widow. Yes, you got something for the widow. Because these children are our future. They impact our communities. Communities are made up of people. And children grow up to be adults. And certain kinds of adults. They are a social capital. They are the vital hallmarks of our, of our culture and our, our country, our nation, the world. We can't afford to squander children, you know, in, in bad behavior, adults doing bad behavior, you know, and telling the kid, the kid is a, is a bad person. Who is a bad person, you know? So I want to say that. Somebody asked if um, Pastor Morin to drop them a copy of the book. Thank you for saying that, Sienna. It's on Amazon. You can go pick it up over there. Um, I don't remember how much. How much is it, Bunny? $14, $20? How much? The digital copy is $9.99, and uh, our cover is um, 24 point something. I yes. Think. Okay, so check it out on there. Um, somebody, um, Pat is saying that I'm having literary flashbacks to high school reading of uh, Michael Anthony and V.S. Naipaul. Your story stands among the Caribbean literary masters. Yoo-hoo! Bravo. Yes. Um, <laughs> I didn't anticipate that much, Paul. <laughs> uh, Pat? Well, they put a story out into the world. That's where it goes, you know. Yeah, I feel story. so empowered now. <laughs> Yeah, all stories are in the landscape of knowing and they, they, they lay side by side, across from, underneath, alongside. And that is what I do, what's called cultural rhetorics. We lay stories uh, above, beyond, uh, across from, and that kind of stuff. Okay, anybody in the, um, I haven't checked Facebook yet, but we're gonna take a break here for a poem. Um, we're gonna take a poem break and I'm gonna check uh, Facebook to see if there's anything there. Um, so Bunny, you have someone to read that poem or are you gonna read it? Um, the, I, I guess- or Are we, we not ready yet? We're not ready yet for, for it. Okay, all right. Um, let me go to Facebook and see if there are any comments, questions. Uh, Cliff Morian said it's a heart-rending story and inspiring too. He's my brother. Um, okay, hi Cliff. And Sandrine is saying, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Compton Holder says, I know that how that feels, brother. So there are people who are bringing empathy and stuff like that, which is really good because sometimes we think we're alone in our stories and we're just not right. alone. You know, there are many people. I'm seeing 13 comments here, but I can only see six, four. I don't know where the rest are. Um, maybe they're in another page. Let me check. Um, Bonnie, you can look at your side and see if there are comments there as well. The re before, um, before Sandrine Pauline, it's not a lot of um, comments that you need to reply to. I am not seeing you're look, that. You're looking on Facebook, right? Yeah, I'm on Facebook on what is story say. Yeah, um, 
Just read them get, if you can see them. I can't see them. Um, did you read Geraldine Watson said? Um, no, I haven't seen that. Mm -mm. Okay, so Geraldine Watson said, out of the Crawford's bag, give two examples of what came out of the bag. Uh -huh. Thank you, Geraldine. Geraldine is a, is a what is story say and, and um, book it, you know, fan. All right, so we will proceed. Um, I was wanting to ask you about the expectations of this book. When you wrote this book briefly, because we got to get a clip on it here. We have lots of people who are going to be speaking. Yeah, um, briefly, what are your expectations? Now you've written this book or when you were writing it, what did you expect to happen or to come out of it? Well, the, the truth is, um, as I wrote the book, I was thinking about what can I do to contribute to the conversation of parenting and mm -hmm. providing a tool in the hand of parents that will help them to become conscious and aware of yes how they need to administer their experiences with children for the singular yeah. purpose of um, being mindful of the emotional growth and development of the child, which presents right. a platform for a child to learn how to relate. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I wanted to, I was expecting that, mm -hmm. you know, I would truly be able to provide that platform for parents. And um, in my own local terrain here, I am beginning to sense that there is uh, a new move. People are uh, moving in the direction of wanting to read the volume. Yeah. And, um, I, I was expecting that having completed the, the volume, that people would develop an interest in reading. And so this platform um, affords, um, affords us another opportunity to spread the wings a little more and to allow for that expectation to be realized because more and more people would become aware that this book is available, you know? And um, yes. that basically was what my intention was. And of course, um, I expected to encounter myself. I wanted to have a face up with myself. And uh, right. since I could not talk to myself adequately about my own experience, I, I, I found that um, the ability to write was beginning to develop in me. And I wanted to write the experience so that I can have a, a, a cerebral confrontation, a cerebral experience with myself and to be able to carry out the inventories that I needed to do so that I can be honest with myself in terms of what has happened to me, the impact these things have had on my life and what would I do to bring about transformation in my life so that I can realize a, a better version of myself. Mm -hmm. I like that. So it seems like that, can I say, I don't know if that's true, can I say that that was your aha moment as to oh, yes. Oh, yes. why oh, yes. this book, your aha moment? Well, this, yeah. this, this is not just telling a story, Crocox bag story, just to, you know, to sensationalize a moment, but to have a deep introspective look and a conversation with self and with others and to hold others accountable. I don't know if you, people might be asking, so what happened to the grandmother? Can you tell us, I don't know if we should leave this out the book and they can read the book to find out. No, Maybe they should read the book. book. They got to buy the book, Bonnie. You got to give away everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just, I, interestingly, when you came to the end of the story, I didn't want my participant, our participants to go away with the idea of an uh, anticlimax with regards to myself and my encounter with my grandmother. No, no, no. Um, the, the way you know, I see it, the way... <laughs> Yes, I'm glad that we can spend some time focusing it. on that. Because I don't. Money? Yes. <laughs> As publisher, you sell books. <laughs> Cliffhangers are good things. <laughs> so, people, if you want to know the story, end, please go buy the book and don't borrow the book. I will follow your lead. <laughs> Nine ninety nine is not a lot of money. People say that's yes, coffee yes. money. Buy but, it on no. um, yes. the ebook and read it and and know what happened how the story get resolved, what happened with him and his grandmother, and so on, and so on, and so forth. I know you're dying to tell the story, the whole thing, but... <laughs> but, you know, if you would allow, there is yes. a, um, an important talking point that I think um, will um, be yes. an encourager in terms of um, um, persons securing copies for themselves. Yes. 
Thank um, you. Thank I you use the story saying. not only to, in fact, another part of the ref of my reflection on the story. Um, it became empowered and I became encouraged more to write about it when I um, discovered that at one conference that I had at one of the secondary schools with um, the senior students, I would usually yeah. be asked mm -hmm. the motivational presentations, um, especially as the... the Froze. Oh, oh. Is it me or Bonnie that's frozen? Marlies? I'm not hearing him either. No, he's frozen. Let me give him yeah, a call. I think, yeah, I think he's frozen, Polly. Yeah, I'm every, gonna um, If everybody can just maybe a thumbs up or something to say that you can still hear Pauline and I. Yeah. I can hear Pat. Mm -hmm. Giving him a call. Yes, I think. Yeah. I yeah. Think, oh, so you walked off, um, Pauline. You probably rejoin. Yeah, maybe. Maybe the internet went out. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm going to do a poem. Just give me a minute here. Um, you're frozen. I'm just log back in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you could just extend your thoughts, I'll be. Yes, I, I'll be. I'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's going on over there. This is the moment where you say to people, this is what live TV is about. Yes, yes. So in the meantime, we can have people who have read the book talk about what it's done for them or how they've experienced the book. Um, it's time for reviews. So Janice, can you go ahead? Uh, I think I was supposed to be next because I have something Who's to do with next? Jan If Janice doesn't yeah. mind, Grace. Okay. Grace. Okay, go ahead, Grace. Do you mind, Janice? I don't know if she's listening. No, I don't mind at all. You can go right ahead, Grace. Okay. All right. And um, sitting and listening to Dr. Morian, as we say, um, called Bunny. I think he said most of what I have to say already. <laughs> However, Dr. Beard, <laughs> can I interrupt just to say uh, you may want to restart the uh, recording? I think it will stop. Yeah, Marlies, can you go ahead and restart? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Grace. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now I've been asked to give a brief review. Okay, hope it's not too formal. <laughs> All right, so uh, in reading uh, the Out of the Cro Crocus Bag, it, I will say it's a thorough expose um, on the importance of providing children with safe, caring, non-judgmental, trusting environment in their formative years. And mm -hmm. um, Children need to be allowed to be expressive of, of, expressive of their emotions. That was said, that was a theme going throughout the book, as, or yes. we'll say a motif throughout the book. Uh, the author, Dr. Mori, emphasizes uh, the importance of home in making that happen. And we're from a culture where, you know, we allow children, you know, should be seen and not heard, and especially yes. in expressing our emotions. And I'm just a little quote from the book on page 28. He said that, Human emotions are the powerful and delicate parts of the makeup that parents and caregivers must attend to in the seminal years, the early years. Uh, because this helps children to grow up to be healthy emotionally and be less stressed, and especially, well, if you could say we're in the post pandemic period. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, he makes several claims in the book, such as the need for empathetic caregiving forgiveness, reconciliation, and all of this happening in families. 
I mean, when it happens in the families, it will transfer to the community. So when children are exposed to these traits, uh, they'll be stronger socially and emotionally. And that's a big thing. I mean, as teachers, every day we have to do social emotional learning with the children. So, you know, that's it's right on target. The book came out at the right time. Now, um, all these claims are made, but uh, what makes them credible is that we, is thorough research. Mm -hmm. Thorough research. We can see where he's he done the research in it. And above all else, he used the word of God to support these claims. Now, mm -hmm. this part might sound like, oh, like a boring college textbook about all these things <laughs> about sociology and, and psychology. But one struggle I had was um, what genre to put this book in. Right. I don't, yeah, because, you know, it has all of these things that we can use as a college textbook. But I also saw elements of it being a memoir. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to speak briefly about that. And that made it an easier read. And we've been yeah. talking about sharing our stories. And uh, we know that's what memoir does. You tell your story. So uh, what was very, very effective and made it more credible is that he talks about his own experiences, including the anecdote, of course, of the Crocker's bag, which gives the title to the book. And this is where I just want to talk about a few elements of memoir. One of them, of course, is retrospection. And we heard that over and over, mm -hmm. right? Uh, re retrospection and reflection. So in this, uh, in retrospection, the, the author stands in, uh, in one place and time, and then they look back from that vantage point to make meaning of these experiences in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so we heard a lot about that in from Dr. Um, Morion himself, about him, which we see looking back, and that book is looking back at this experience and making meaningful. And um, so you look back at that distressing episode about being wrongfully accused and um, being cruelly pressured to make false, comp um, false confession and um, the negative impact that it has had on his life. And it, that's what kept me trying to read to see if he reconciled with his grandmother. <laughs> and what I have here is that um, I put in parentheses in, in my notes is that um, I'm not going to give it away. You have to buy the book. And so I'm laughing when you were trying, he wants to give it away and you were trying to tell him you got to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the things. Um, another quickly, another um, element of memoir is reflection. And uh, we see yeah, that yeah. all the time, that reflective quality he reflects on the Crocker's bag issue. He reflects on the death of his sister, his mom mm -hmm. meeting Clive and other anecdotes. And um, he makes me and he connects them. And we can also make those connections. We can mm -hmm. also make those connections. Honesty, he was honest. He could have hidden it, you know, but honesty, he talks about it. And um, another thing is that the book has also broken the silences surrounding uh, child rearing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that also and, and in our culture. Yes. And that's, yes. an, that's another memoir element. So I'm trying to give the book that genre of, of memoir. At least it's memoir-like. Yes. So, yes. And it leads us to ask ourselves, you know, who are we on this issue? Where do we stand? Mm -hmm. Where do we stand? And one of the main things also is that as you talk about it, it brings healing. Telling our stories bring healing. And I remember, I um, don't want to be too long, um, in South Africa when they did that Truth and Reconciliation Commission that they had, there was someone, you know, who was blind, who was wrong because of, you know, apartheid and what was done to him. He was blind. And one of the things he said when he was able, when he was able to tell his story, he said, you know what? I might be physically blind, but I'm now able to see because I was able to tell my story. Mm -hmm. So telling our stories, we cannot um, repeat it enough, is very, very important. So in conclusion, I will say the book ends in a powerful way with um, Christ's call to children to be released. And uh, I, I guess the author is going to do some reading, so I don't know if he wanted to read that, which is on page 143. And um, I would recommend, recommendation, you give a review, trying to be formal, is that I would recommend the book to all caregivers, mm -hmm. parents, 
teachers, pastors. I, to me, could even be a supplemental text at least, you know, for, um, for college students. So yeah, yeah. congratulations to my cousin, pastor, Dr. Morian. And I know that we all will be blessed with this book. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And we have been listening to Mrs. Grace Semple Benjamin, who's a lifelong educator. She's worked as a teacher and a peer instructional coach and a new teacher mentor. Um, her work is guided by the principle that teaching is a gift that should be used to bless humanity and build up the kingdom of God. This is supported by 1 Peter 4.10, which says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Thank you so much, Grace. Yep. Love You're it. Welcome. Yes. Yes. Um, I recognize that struggle as to what this book is because, yeah, as when I worked with this book, I wondered what, what, what would it be? What, what can it be like? And that's how it came out. Yeah. And some other things that went into crafting it the way it's been crafted. Um, I don't see Bonnie back on here. Is he back? Yes, he is. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, you are here. Um, so we're going to step right along. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the items to see where I am at. Um, we're supposed to have a break, but it's going to be this poem break. While and then we're going to have we're supposed to have Colwick Wilson and Howard Simon. So I'm going to go ahead with the poem. You know, we've been talking about these things that's very heavy and so on. So let's be, let's laugh. And this one is called I Laugh, I Laugh, I Laugh by Dr. Dalston Moriam. Moriam. <laughs> I laugh at the ant that crawls on my knee. I laugh at the bee on the rosebush tree. I laugh at the frog that leaps on the grass. I laugh at the noise of the crickets as they pass. In them, all such rare beauty I see. So I take time to laugh. I laugh, I laugh, I laugh. I laugh at the butterfly as it floats around, pollinating the flowers with never a sound. I laugh at the birds with their chirp on the bay as they whistle their melody all through the day. In them, all such pristine beauty I see. So I take time to laugh. I laugh, I laugh, I laugh. I laugh at the mango upon the box of spice and palawi tree. Ah! How succulent, how sweet, <laughs> how juicy to me. I laugh at the rain with its magical drops. It makes the flowers grow into an amazing crop. In them, I see such beauty. So I take time to laugh. I laugh, I laugh, I laugh. I laugh at the horses in their thunderous run. How powerful in their gallop. It's just speed and fun. I laugh at the squirrel as they hop and peep, gathering nuts so they could crack and eat. In them, I, such beauty I see. So I laugh, I take time to laugh and laugh. No one can tell me there is no beauty in these things. I see great love. And to the creator, I sing everything in nature from the ant to the summers and spring tells the precious story of God and, great and the great king. In them, I see such miracle. So I take time to laugh. I laugh. Ha, ha, ha. I laugh. Ha, 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 ha. I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, la, la. Oh, so, <laughs> I hope everybody laughing. Uh, when you can come out of such horrendous situations and still laugh, it just tells us the kind of a man you are. So we just don't like to laugh. Did you have audio questions? Did you open up? Uh, Pauline, um, you went very low for some reason. I can hardly hear you. <clears throat> no, I can't. I can't. I can't hear you on this side. You cannot. Like I can hear you, but it sounds very distant, as if you are far away from your mic. No, I'm right here. I I haven't done anything different. Uh, 
Now there's no sound. Uh, Bonnie, can you say something to make sure that the song is still here? I... Yeah, so your song is still Can you here. hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. It's just Pauline. Um, I'm having difficulty hearing. Say something, Pauline. Hi. Yeah, I can I can hear for some on my side, it just sounds very distant. Just go ahead with testimonials. I'm gonna go get my headset. Okay. and he is the president of USC, um, okay. University of Southern Caribbean, and uh, um, Dr. Howard Simon. Uh, Bonnie, you're muted if you were speaking. What I'm saying is that maybe what we can do is to um, include Roland Dola as one of our co-hosts. He might be able to help us because I'm not sure what is happening on my side here. We can hear you. Bunny, can you hear me? I'm not sure what is happening. Can you hear us, Bonnie? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, so I think it's only uh, Pauline if, um, if everybody can attest that they can hear both Bonnie and I, um, that would probably help. Just a thumbs up will be fine. Yeah, I think just, uh, it's probably all that laughing that Pauline did just <laughs> kind of uh, knocked her sound out. <laughs> You're muted, Pauline. <clears throat> okay, I am not sure that she heard that if you said that she was muted. Can you say something now, Pauline? Can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Yes, you're back. Awesome. Okay. Yes. So, Bonnie, what I was saying, let's go with the... um. You see, it's a laughing thing you had me on. <laughs> Don't make me laugh and knock out the, knock out the internet. <laughs> so, all right, let's hear from Colwick and from Howard. We're approaching the seven o'clock hour for me, which is, I don't know, what is it for you guys? Six, six o'clock, yeah. Bunny, what's yes. going on? Um, how would from... be there? At least we can start with him and then um, we can. Yes. Probably... Mm -hmm. Howard, so... go right ahead. And uh, Mr. Howard Simon is, he is, what is it? He's a radio personality, pastor, author, doctor, father, husband, tuition. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great men from Cedar Hall. <laughs> Noble Spartan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Beard. I'm deeply delighted, profoundly pleased, and highly honored uh, just to share this uh, marvelous moment, this uh, monumental milestone in the kingdom of God, in the Caribbean in Guyana and throughout the world. I'm very, very pleased and proud of you, my friend, Dr. Morian. Uh, we have been best of friends, David, Jonathan type friends for 30 years. And I knew nothing about the Crocus bag experience until reading this book. And before I continue, Dr. Beard, I'm asking you leave if you would uh, induct me in the, uh, the Guyanese fraternity so that I can come back on this platform. I think uh, my friendship with Dr. Morian 
is sufficient <laughs> to make you a Guyanese by adoption and also by association. <laughs> All right. But this, we will work at that. You're working it. Wonderful, wonderful. But this has been such a moving and such a riveting experience to me, not just being here, but having read the book. You know, uh, I'm not the same having read the book. You know, uh, this is uh, such a sad story, such a terrible tragedy of the most brutal uh, betrayal and uh, the worst case scenario of domestic violence. As the author would have said, he died a million times, you know, without really dying in that crocus bag. And, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to see what the author went through and to see what came out of the crocus bag uh, tells me that there's still good things that come out of Nazareth, you know, because something as ordinary as the crocus bag that would bring out such extraordinary principles and such an extraordinary publication and such an extraordinary life tells me that the, the extraordinary still comes out of the ordinary and uh, the uncommon still comes out of the uncommon. I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book, even though I went through every single emotion. I was sad for my friend, angry sometimes, reduced to tears at other times. And the book is about emotions. And you really can't read the book without going through the full spectrum of emotions. Because Dr. Dawson Morian is a splendid storyteller. He has the ability to bring you into the story with effortless ease and to deposit such you know, graphic details that if you're as close to him as I am, maybe you're not, you know, you would actually live the moments with him. But even though you may not be as close to him as I am, you know, his, his ability to tell a story uh, it, it is so powerful and profound that he would take you into the book and you would feel as if you're in that crocus bag with him waiting to ex uh, ex exhale, wondering if he would survive. And uh, you know, that, 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 that's the quality of the, this work that is so well written. So, uh, you know, poetically penned and his poetry comes through in the book, his storytelling comes through in the book. It, 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 it's a beautiful blend of interdisciplinary you know, uh, affiliation, you see his theological soundness, uh, his psychological training. You can see that he's a man that is schooled with soci sociological, you know, uh, giftedness and, and human development. And he, he, he brings in the work an amazing amalgamation of many disciplines in order to get the story told. And, and so this is a work uh, 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 of the highest order. And I agree with Professor Grace, you know, who would have said that this ought to be, you know, a, a must read for all caregivers and pastors and teachers. And it should be a textbook at USC and other schools, you know, because it's such a powerful work. And, and to see what the story did in St. Lucia, when he would have told it to the students there it, it, it is, is a, per, a preview of what it would do in classrooms. I believe that it would be uh, therapeutic, you know, in the classrooms, just being able to hear the story and to wait for the ending. And that nobody's giving away the ending. I agree with you, Dr. Baird, that you have to buy it. I've already purchased, you know, my uh, e-copy. Uh, e you know, uh, my Kindle version. I'm waiting, Dr. Morian, to get my physical copy because, you know, something like this, it's really a keepsake. I want to be able to underline it and to read it over and to be able to relive some of uh, the tragedy of your life. You know, uh, Dr. Morian, you know, writes this book and he really becomes an advocate for all children. He has given voice to the voiceless. 
and he has become a protector of the weak, as if to say that what he went through, he wishes that no other child would have to go through. You know, he speaks that, and you could see, you know, um, that, that, that his coming out. And the coming out is not really a puntilier or just a one-time event. It's really linear. And, and you can see the coming out of the book in terms of the, the, uh, the beautiful heart that God has given Dr. Morian, his love for children. And he would tell the story, you know, the little guy, I think his name was Chris, and, and how he would <laughs> shepherd that guy, you know, just made him a celebrity for a day and, and how he nourished and nurtured him. And, you know, uh, for no reason except to make him feel special. And, and he would follow up on that story three years later and to find that the young man was growing and preaching and becoming such a champion for the Lord. And, and, and so we see Dr. Morin coming out not only as a voice to the voiceless, but an activist who would deposit, you know, our light in the midst of darkness. He, he, he parallels his story with that little lad saying that he came from the same country area and he wanted to do for that child what he wished would have been done to him. You know, the story, you know, coming out of the, the crocus bag, you know, really shows the triumph of family that his mother came to his rescue in his darkest moment when he thought that his life would have just evaporated and ended there and then his mother came uh, to his rescue. And, and he talks not only about family or his mother, but he talks about the power of forgiveness, you know, uh, and, and, and what that, <laughs> my wife is waving her hand at me, try, maybe trying to say, uh, Dr. Morian, don't give too much away. <laughs> but suffice it to say, uh, he teaches powerfully that one of the things that happens when you come out of the crocus bag is not only that you bring functionality to your family, but it, it, it affords you the privilege, the grace of being able to forgive. He also talks about friendship, you know, and, and how that is so critical in, in uh, you know, helping children to be able to grow their emotions in a healthy way. Uh, the book really, the thesis of the book is possibly that harsh, you know, parenting or abuse, you know, uh, provides emotional scars that causes individuals, if they don't overcome or continue to overcome, to bleed throughout their lives. It's a powerful work. It's an excellent work. And I would recommend it to everyone who hears. You know, as I said, I have uh, a Kindle version of this book. I'm looking forward to getting a hard copy because it has done a, a wonderful work in my own life. And I'm looking forward to reading it again and to share it with my wife and also my children. And I definitely would be an advocate of getting this book out, not only because Dr. Maureen and I are friends, but because it's such a powerful presentation of the indomitable spirit of resilience that you know, uh, came out of that crocus bag. And so the, the, the story came out of the crocus bag, the survival came out of the crocus bag, you know, and lots of principles. I believe that sometimes God gives us crocus bag moments as he gave to Joseph. And this, this, this story parallels Joseph's story. When, when Maureen was in that crocus bag, you know, I remembered Joseph when he was in the pit and the prison and so on. I remember Jesus when he was on the cross. And I felt like my friend was being crucified, but for the salvation and messianic intervention of his mother. It's a powerful work. I recommend it to you. I definitely would get a hard copy and I need to get some just to give the friends and so forth and so on. Maureen, congratulations, my brother, my friend. It's an excellent expression and you have done us proud and we're proud of you. God bless you. Much success on the journey. Yippee. Yippee. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, for that. Um, uh, for those who haven't gotten the book and you want to be in the moment, remember 
be kind to a child. Nobody is saying don't discipline your child or discipline children. But abuse is a whole different thing. We have to be vigilant, cognizant, and know it's not a one-off thing. These things have lifelong effects, okay? So um, if there is no call week, we're gonna move on to, um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Janice Emmanuel McLean. And after her, Neil Chaitan, Dr. Neil Chaitan. Um, please be mindful of the time, you know, cause we have, we will have the audience on Zoom and Facebook have their say as well. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I am so delighted that my spiritual son invited me to be a part of this journey. Bunny, I'm incredibly proud of you. The way you have masterfully put this book together, it is amazing. Your literary and journalistic skills are beyond measure. When I think of the concepts that you have layered in this story, it gives me just chills to know that you have gone through such an experience and you can use it as a teachable moment. You know, as adults, sometimes we do not think of the emotions of children. Being a teacher for so many years, I am very much conscious of how we can harm children, not only physically, but verbally. And when I listened to your story, it really brought to my mind that every one of us, we are responsible. It takes a village. And each of us must show up every day being responsible for every child. It may not be our physical, biological child or grandchildren, but we are responsible. We have to make sure that these children are not abused emotionally, mentally, and physically. Thanks so very much for sharing your experience. I could say a lot more, but because time is limited, I wanna say to everyone, Purchase this book for yourself and buy for your family members and your friends because this is a treasure. And we cannot help but saying, congratulations, my son. God bless you as you continue to use your talents that are so multifaceted to be a blessing to others. You have sown into the lives of so many and we are the richer because of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> said Janice, it's awesome. Yes, it's a privilege to hear these stories. And can we hear from the next person, Dr. Neil Chaitan? Is he around? I don't see him there, um, um, Doc. So okay. I guess, um, we will have to. Fool. Yeah, here's Many. what. Yes. Okay. Um, somebody is asking, Shauna Austin in Buxton, Guyana is asking, how can she get the book if it's going to be available in Guyana? I told her you're going down there sometime, but where else can she get the book? Okay, well, what she can do is um, try to get me her um, address and I can probably get a copy um, posted to her. Can you um, put your email address in the chat? Yes, I can. And, I can. Or I could put it on, I know her personally, so I'm, I can give her that information as well. Well, I guess for the, for the, um, for the benefit of everyone online who might want to ask the same question, then the email give address your email. would definitely help. Okay. Can you say it out loud so they can get it? Okay, it's D-O-L-R-U underscore 64 at yahoo.com. Let me do that again. D-O-L-R-U underscore 64 at yahoo.com.
I just put it in the I just put it in the chat. Yes. And again, the book is available on Amazon as an ebook. So it doesn't have to get mailed to you. And you can have paperback as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, where do we go from here? So now I'm going to open the floor to anybody who's been listening on Zoom. Just unmute yourself and have your say. How do you enter this story or not? When I say enter, I mean, what resonates with you? What can you recall? Let's lay our story beside story on top of story across some story and have our say about this important, um, in this important topic. So the floor is open. When you were listening, what came to you? What kind of thoughts you had and stuff like that. Everybody's silent, they're thinking or they don't want to speak. Uh, I don't see anything here. Yeah, I know growing up in Buxton, I used to hear stories about, uh, I know there was this particular girl that used to live in the pasture and she was living with a woman named Miss Rose. And there were stories about how Miss Rose would put her in Crocox bag and beat her, you know. And as kids, I don't, as a kid, I don't think I ever thought much of it. Um, so these practices become like a norm, but it's good that you have a voice that you can speak out against it and things like that. But in reading the book, um, don't be afraid to get it because it's not a heavy read. You don't feel I didn't come out feeling depressed because of the work you did in unpacking, unpacking the stories. And there are more stories than the Crocus Bag story. There are lots of stories about you and your friends and some of the things you guys did and, and things like that and other life experiences. So it's not just the one story in the book. Um, for those who do not know, this book has been published by Comarca Tree Books. And here again, it's another journey. I read books as a kid and always liked reading. I traveled the world in books. And as a child, I had this image of a book box. I don't know if, if you can call, I don't really call it a book box, like a, a box with um, books. And I could see the spines of these books. You see, these are my books here. I could see the spines of books as a kid and books that I would have written because I had this idea. It just stayed with me. It wasn't something at the top of my, my, my um, list or anything, but it's just something I, I desire I had. So having read books, I started to write books and go through that process. And after I started writing and people started telling me about their books, I decided to make a publishing company to help our people publish their books, to bring the, these stories to the world, because, um, because I could, and I learned how to do it. So when Bonnie came along with his book, as a matter of fact, when he came the first time, I said, look, I don't have the time. I have too much on my plate, you know, doing the professor type of work and, and editing and all that stuff. And I said, maybe in 10 months. Was it 10 months I told you, Bonnie? 10 months? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And then did. I didn't think, I didn't think he would come back, to be honest. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, he's not going to come back. Sure enough, October, he came back and said, well, I got the book. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to work <laughs> through it. <laughs> and so I took what he gave and, you know, there's a process I go through to get it to the place where it is. And he's a very good person to work with because I would work with, he's, he's, a, he's, a, um, he's well, what should I say? Easy to work with, not quarrelsome and batteration as we say, <laughs> you know, not annoying. So I would have a suggestion and he would take the suggestion and he would have a suggestion and I would work with that suggestion and work through it all the way through. So, that's a service I offer to anyone who wants to have their book. Once it, once it aligns with my beliefs and um, practices and if it's ethical and some other things. 
So that's what. Children write too. This is a little children's book here. A 12-year-old wrote, an 11-year-old wrote this book called The Move. And I worked with her. And this is her story here, you know. And I had her on Book It as well. Yes. And then Marlies talked about my latest book. This is it, Dave and the Lime Tree. And it's on Amazon. So enough about me and about what I do. But I just wanted to share that to say I walk the walk, I talk the talk, I do the do. Yeah. So. Anything else from anyone? Because we're going to be wrapping Maybe up Maybe before soon. someone come in, um, um, there is Janik um, Alfred. I don't know if it's too late in your, in your time and in your um, consideration. Um, she was supposed to do the forward for, read the forward for us. Um, but having, um, if she can do that, I, can, I would be appreciative. But um, I'm happy that you said that um, I was easy to work with. Um, it is, it is interesting to know that I think we have lost you, Pauline. Um, Marlissa, have we lost Pauline again? Um, I just see her screen. Are you there, no, Pauline? No. Okay, she, she, she's here. I, she's probably frozen a little. Yeah, I have, no, I have an unstable internet, but I'm hearing you now. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I was saying that um, you did mention the fact that um, very easy to work with. Well, I, I, I am truly not very difficult to work with. Um, it doesn't take much to please me, but when I sense from my gut that I'm in the hand of an expert, I don't worry myself. If you catch what I mean. I don't know if I'm an expert, I'm learning as I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but I, actually, I, yes. No, let, let me take it. Let me um, take that back. Um, by training, I have a, a doc doctoral degree in rhetoric and writing. So I know some things about writing, but knowing things about writing and writing are two different things. <laughs> so, but over time, I've done the work myself and knowing what I know about writing, I was able to apply that with the experience I've had to. I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes. It's not a perfect thing. Um, but when we're working together, we can produce a product that people would love. And remember, we had a debate as to the title of the book? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a debate because he wanted it to be something else. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> and then I gave him the reason why we should go with this. And Pam is saying, Pamela Robert Benjamin is saying, I never heard of the bag being used as a means of punishment. What? Pam, that's a common thing, girl. I was very emotional listening to the contents of the book. Congratulations, we are proud of you, Dr. Morian. Yes, um, in Box and Village, I've heard people do that. You know, beat children in bag. They don't try to throw them in the ocean, but they would put them in bag and beat them. I don't know if it's a, a, a it's not a pervasive thing, but I've heard it happen. Yeah. I've never seen it, but I've heard it. And other things, peppering children and so on. People need to stop that nonsense. Yes, and I, I, stop it. I, I beg to commend that point to empower um, to throw in my little span and tighten up on that point. Um, we, do, mm -hmm. we do harm to children when we do these things. And I would suspect that the innocence in the mind of my grandmother being convinced about mm -hmm. um, this, this thing of the hard truth against my truth, you know, mm -hmm. um, creates a kind of psychological lockdown in our mind that does not allow for mm -hmm. a child, in my, in my case, to have his say. And of course, mm -hmm. that's the reason why in some parts of the book, I wrote about a child's right to be represented. You know, a child mm -hmm. has a right to yeah. be represented. A child has a right to be heard. A child has a right to justice and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you are a kid, you're not aware of these things, your life and that is the reason why it is so, it's so important for parents to be careful and caregivers to be careful about what they do, how they influence the life of a child, because it can um, get a child to the point where the child can fail or succeed in life. And all of these are things, the living things that impact the life of the child. And um, we, we, we have come to a day and age where we need, to, we need to drop the ignorance, if I may use that word, and get real and uh, become intentional and deliberate about learning what it takes to become a parent, not just to marry someone, but to get someone to live home with. Because ultimately, if you're serious, a kid is going to um, emerge 
if I may use that word again, you know, but every child is of infinite value and we've got to see a child from the point of view of value and be careful about how we administer. So I, I am in total, um, total, I'm in a total upset with, with individuals who use these, these, um, these quasi kind of approach for disciplining ch children and that kind of stuff. It is really, really tough, you know. Sometimes I, I think of this story and when the crocker's bar comes to my mind, I feel I'm suffocating. You know, I have to mm -hmm. remind myself that I need to pass that threshold and get over it yes. because it's no more happening mm -hmm. to you. Because the truth is, um, in my little life, I've seen banana, a bunch of banana in a crocker's bag, not an individual in a crocker's bag. Right. <laughs> it's true. As I Pam say, she can never, she never, never heard of people in crocker's bag, you know. And when, um, when is it to name? Uh, Grace mentioned, you know, it reads like a memoir. When I first read your manuscript, that was what grabbed me. I was reading all this, the, you know, the, the psychology and the sociology and the, whatever else you're talking about, neuroscience, and because all that's in this book. But, it, but it's so nicely put, you know, and well-placed. I was reading all those really, really fast. And then I got to the story. I'm like, oh, and I'm a storyteller. A story writer said so the story grabbed me and so all the narratives i went through the whole thing i read all the narratives first and i said oh okay so that was what helped me to get through the book and to understand where you're coming from so we're almost at the time when we're gonna finish so if there's no one else to speak or to say anything we're gonna wrap up um anything else I've just placed my, my email address and my phone number for WhatsApp. If you want to contact me, it's in the chat. Yeah. Mary says, looking back at our youthful days, I now understand some guarded behaviors. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Because children grow up to distrust adults, yeah, or other people, very guarded. And you did mention that, you know, what it looks like, what that trauma looks like in an adult. Yeah. And you know, sometimes in the village, we don't allow kids to have a voice to say, we don't cultivate the environment and the opportunities for kids to speak. We don't give them, allow them voice or even teach them how to speak back to adults. It's like adults speak and you, you may speak. But yeah. we don't, sometimes you don't have this conversational engagement with a parent. Well, to say, well, um, this is what happened. And here's what I think. And given that, that, given opportunities for opinions and airing that, it's not always there in every family. So I could assume that if you're not raised that way, how do you get to, to talk yourself out and to be heard with an adult? You see, is their word and you have to suck it up and then, or a word and a blow. Yeah. Yeah. And the Pauline, and, I don't know if you story. were able to read on, um, on Facebook, um, Ruth uh, Morian said your experiences in life can either emotionally break you or make you. But if you are broken, mm -hmm. the content of this book can help you mend, um, help, help to mend your emotion. Mm. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I, I was yeah. saying that, um, that was a very important point that my wife just made there, um, her comment. But I was leading on to say that um, when the experience of freedom of a child is repressed, because that's what I experienced in the Crocus bag, I felt that my freedom was repressed. It was taken away from me. Um, it does psychological, mental, and emotional um, damage. And sometimes that can lead, if you're not properly guided afterward, it can lead you to the point where you even begin to distrust the whole idea and the whole concept of God. And the question that is raised, could, could it be that in our experience of administering these repressive responses to children's freedom, have we not made more atheists than we have made believers? Mm -hmm. hmm. Something to consider. 
and you know mary yeah you know looking back um from our time hold on i'm in a meeting looking back from our time you know i spent a um couple years working in that area whatever had happened we may not have known but there was an astuteness in bunny as we will call him and i don't know you know now that you know i work in mental health and i you know work with children this book really makes me cry you know when mm -hmm. to think about children and the way you know you're treated and i remember there was a line which says here that um can remember exactly but looking back at him he wore it very well mm -hmm. he was proud he like, <laughs> like in his mind he knew that one day i am going to get out of this i mm -hmm. am going to be somebody i mm -hmm. am going mm -hmm. to pass these hurdles and that's how I saw him as a young person growing up, you mm -hmm. know, in the village. And uh, mm -hmm. you're one of the people that I always say, you know, I'm really proud of what you have become not, you know, and his mom, his mom, she was the nicest person from the little that I known of her, you know, I'm just proud of you. Thank and you, I'm man. really happy to celebrate. And, you know, this book here, you know, I know this is not my only copy I'll buy. It will be like presents for parents. And um, yes. there are some parents that I encounter on the job. I'm definitely, you know, will recommend and, you know, put the word out there. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate your your comments and um, your encouragement, uh, Mary. You have been a friend over the years and um, I want to thank you for participating in our program, our event here today. And um, you did make mention of the fact that um, you did see me as a person who was determined to get out mm -hmm. of this whole experience. Um, I must say that um, sometimes, you know, Pauline, when I was in that garden that I'm um, doing my allotted part to make sure that I contributed to the to the needs of the family by growing my okros and my callaloo and my, my spring onions, my shallot and all of that stuff. Um, the place where we lived in the Golden Fleece, you hardly would see an airplane. Once in a blue moon, you would see them passing. Mm -hmm. And I would remember on those occasions when those airplanes would pass over by our side and you hear the, the sound of it coming. You know, in those moments, <clears throat> I would forget what I was doing and just look up. And sometimes they would pass just over my head. And I would say to myself, one of these days, I will be in your belly, going somewhere for something better. And I want to thank God that those small dreams, I mean, those big dreams in my <clears throat> really came to fruition. And um, I am thankful to all those who contributed in my life one way or the other. This is not a story about me. It's a story about all the people all the persons who have touched my life in one way or the other, I am, I am celebrating you in this book because had it not been for you, they would not be this book. Mm, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So to know Dulce and Maureen, um, Patricia Hudson says, I'm going to finish the sentence just now. She said, celebrating the resilience of the author, working with high acuity, depressed and anxious suicidal adults, I can affirm that the heights of the, that the heights the author reached is not an ordinary feat. What an <clears throat> anthem to the power of God. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and uh, Patricia. Um, is Patricia on here? Why am I saying Andrea? Patricia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for that. To know Dr. Dalston Morian or to know Bonnie Morian from back, at his, back in the day. When you encountered Bonnie Morian, whether it's camp or after camp or Pathfinder, he's somebody <laughs> because he coming with all his somebodiness. He got his somebodiness and he getting somebody too. 
<laughs> so when you meet him at CUC, he follows somebody else. You cannot erase that, and you don't know that the somebody else had an encounter with Krokox bag. Yes. So with that, we want to close. We're on top of the hour, and this lady has to go to work. It's Monday morning. You know, you know, and, um, Pauline, if you would just allow we're gonna one have, on me, on me. And yeah. what you just said there is so meaningful. And what that does for me, it allows me to view the next individual that I meet from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Everybody is carrying mm -hmm. a bag and you don't know what is inside of that bag. What comes out of it sometimes yes. gives us a platform for judgment, false judgment. But we do not mm -hmm. understand that deeper than what mm -hmm. you see come out of the crocker's bag is what has been in the crocker's bag. And what is it that molded that person into being becoming what that person is or mm -hmm. is becoming? So we have to be very careful mm -hmm. about how we judge people because you may never know what yes. their story is all about. Yes. And sometimes people see you walking in somebody and they say, who she thinks she is or who he think he is at all. That's they begin to judge you. Yes, but yeah. all you're doing is pulling the grace of God with you and walking in your purpose with your chest full outside because you're coming out of bags, you're carrying bags. You never know. Thank you so much for that. Um, just um, quickly, so, uh, Pauline, yeah. Dr. Baird, I would just yeah. um, like to thank you for being a wonderful host. I <laughs> kept it lively and I enjoyed your hosting. <laughs> I really love to have you guys here. If you want more stories, come to what the stories say. Click the button <laughs> and follow. I tell the village stories, all of them. And this is emancipation time. And when I was thinking about doing Bonnie's uh, book it at this time, I thought, you know, I'm not going to do the secular um, stories. I'm going to do this one. And when I thought about emancipation, I'm thinking about the man in the emancipation. What is emancipation? And the Bob, Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. This is, I think this is one step in that direction. You know, we can walk with the celebration and think about what's happening there. What can we do for ourselves? You know, our people have come through a lot, a lot of trauma, more of a hooks bag, shackles, shackles, whatever. But then if we can still walk in our humanity, and oh, what God gave us with full chest, knowing where we've come from. And like Maya Angelou say, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. 10,000. So when I feel, you know, intimidated or whatever, and, you know, have to face the crowd, I always think of those who are behind me who, or who came before me. I'm, I'm not the only one. I have a lot of people who have walked the path and gone through stuff and, you can still come out ahead. So if there's nothing else to say or to do, we should wrap it up. And I think Howard has the benediction. And Bonnie, you had some gratitude things to say. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to um, you personally, Pauline, for You're going welcome. through this journey. Um, you have been an amazing editor. You have helped to fix my confused thoughts and put them plainly and simply, mm -hmm. but yet profoundly for people to read about them. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to you. I'm eternally grateful to Welcome. you for your patience. In the midst of all that you have on your hand, you still took the time out to, to, to work with me, and I am all the better for it. I also want to thank um, Grace, um, a dear friend of mine, um, uh, a mentor in the district. I, I want to uh, say special thanks to her for participating and for helping to um, bring to the stage some of my thoughts that I could not, we could not deal with today and to provide her overview of what she, she has pulled out of this book that is meaningful and um, can present it in such a way that um, people could be convinced, participants can be convinced here and beyond um, that they need to secure a copy of this book. I also want to thank my dear friend and my Jonathan, and my, my David, rather. I'm the Jonathan, he is the David. Sometimes I get confused with that. But that's all how it is. He loves him better for others than for himself. And um, I really appreciate his humility, his friendship over the years. Um, and maybe the two of us need to get down and talk about the palm and the box and spice uh, mango. <laughs> he and I go way back and we have some stories for him. <laughs> but more than that, yeah, you made me laugh. <laughs> uh, more than that, I think um, Pastor Simon, Dr. Simon is a person 
that I have come to know to be a person who takes people along with them. He sees the good in you. And um, my aspiration to, of becoming a, a poet stemmed from his encouragement. He always told me that there was something in the way I expressed myself and I should be a poet. You know, and then one day I decided I was going to write one and send it to him so that he can give me a, a failing grade. But when he returned the copy to me, he could only give words of affirmation and how gracious this was. And so during the COVID period of time, when I could not do a lot of other things, um, I, I used that time to write poems. And um, on poemhunter.com, I think I have about 37 poems there altogether. And um, I want to thank him not only for encouraging me to write my poems and express myself in that way, but for just being a friend to me and my family and for allowing me to be a part of his life and his family's life. It's been a beautiful blend and I, I'm eternally grateful to him. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. McLean for her um, participation, for participating um, on this afternoon literary event. Um, she has been an amazing mother. In fact, it was um, at my church when she conducted a two weeks evangelistic effort that I was baptized. Um, she became a mother and a friend to me. And over the years, we have never lost track of each other. And um, I still have warm recollections of your goodness in my life. And I want to thank you for playing um, the motherly part that you have played in my life. Um, it has contributed to who I am today. And I am eternally grateful to you. I also want to I want to thank Janik for being a part, though she was not able to read the forward, but Janik is a very special person to me. I also want to thank um, Dr. Kwesi Ojinga for reading uh, my poem, Chiseled, so beautifully. It's my favorite, by the way. And Chiseled um, is a parallel to the book that I have read because when I was writing the book, I saw myself as being chiseled, you know? Though it came out of a bad situation, it was that very situation that God was using to be a part of the chiseling of my life. And I want to thank you, um, Dr. Jingle, for so smartly reading that poem with such life and such energy, just the way that I wanted it. No one could have read that poem like you did. I've heard it being read before. And I want to thank you, not only for reading the poem, but for being there. And I want to assimilate you into my list of friendship. And I want to thank Pauline for exposing me to you. Uh, Marlis, you've done a wonderful job. And I want to thank you also for being a friend of, um, of Pauline, Dr. Dr. Beard. And um, like Jesus, any person who is a friend of Pauline is a friend of mine. So welcome to my friendship. I look forward to seeing you and meeting you sometime so that we can exchange a little Indian roti and with some hot curry or something like that so that we can deepen our friendship. And I'm eternally grateful to God for bringing me out of that crocus bag, reflecting on it. Had it not been for God who were on my side, I would have well my slip and would have fallen. I would be remiss if I did forget anyone that I should have said thanks to. It was not intentional. It's just a slip of my mind. So I, because there is plenty of forgiveness in the crocus bag, I send some of that. I receive some of that from you. And those yeah, are big comments on Facebook and uh, other and on the plat other platforms. I want to thank you also for participating. And um, I believe it all my heart that you're going to get a copy of this book, not for the price and um, the benefits, the financial benefits that come to me, because that's the least on my mind. Uh, when I was writing this book, I was writing from the standpoint of the possibility of a child's transformation. This is what this is all about for me. But if you were to purchase a copy and purchase a copy for someone else, I would be eternally grateful for that. Thanks again. Thank you. Howard? Let's bow our heads as we pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this amazing accomplishment, this monumental milestone. We thank you for the life and ministry of your dear son, Dr. Dalston Morian. And though we cry out against domestic violence and abuse of every kind, we give you thanks for the fact that he did not die in the crocus bag, but that great golden gems are now flowing out of the crocus bag 
And so he can join with Joseph in saying what was intended to, the, to be the most cruel form of punishment, abuse, and victimization has come today to save many lives. I pray your blessings upon the book that it would touch untold millions and that in every classroom, in every family where this book is read, glory and honor would be given to your name. Yes. Thank you so much for the ministry of Dr. Beard and Book It. I pray God that this platform would continue to loom large as a wonderful movement of allowing your kingdom to be expanded and to, hear, to allow uh, different art forms, different genre to be a blessing to our lives and to the wider community. Thank you again for this wonderful experience. And I pray that you'll continue uh, to bless the work. May it be a blessing to many, many, many people and may generations yet and born be blessed because this book is written. And I pray God that the hearts that the Elijah experience would be experienced through this book, that the hearts of children and parents would be turned to each other in unity and in blessing and turn to our Father God. Thank you for blessing, for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. So thank you, Dane and Cecilia, Patricia, Pam, Janique, Tyrone, Sean, I think that's Sean, Compton, Claudette. Hi, Claudette. Claudette from Annandale, Indiana. <laughs> um, Roland and Marlies, of course. Marlies is my wing person. She, oh, Marlies dedicates this platform, this um, Zoom for us as part of her service to our community. She does a wonderful job with women, um, body positivity, body fitness. Wow. I work out with her. If you want to work out, work out with Marlies. It's Marlies train. She'll get you in shape. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and um, Marlies is actually a face girl. Yeah, so indeed, 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 indeed. Oh, Polly, you might be setting me up for something that I, I, I cannot deliver on, but thank you so much. <laughs> no, she deliver for me. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Jillian, uh, Sharon, Janice, all of them, and everybody on Facebook who's watching, Shauna, Sandrine, Compton, Cliff, all of those people, yeah. Root, yes. Root, Bonnie's wife is on Facebook, yeah. <laughs> Big part of this. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, see, Marley, <laughs> Steph, the girl knows, yeah, Pardon? she knows how the fitness and food. Marley's is good with fitness and food and body, body posi positivity and women's empowerment. Yes, that's her thing. Yeah. And she's a best-selling author. Um, Marley, you want to pop your book? link in the in the chat or on the live somewhere um i yeah. don't have the i don't have the, the link but that's uh we'll we share can it put it on, on, on what we'll share it later yeah. yeah yes all right Get yes you know and... there was somebody there that i didn't make mention of that is andrea that is patricia's sister um she happened yes. to be the editor for my first book on claim so i want to publicly okay. um, indicate my appreciation to her so that the public will know that she's my friend and um, has done some good work with, with, uh, with yeah. my first and I'm appreciative too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Patricia is on here. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Um, I'm going to go start my day, um, my work day, sorry. And I will see you on the next Book It. I don't know who will be on yet. Um, I have another child, I have two child authors. So one of them probably will be on the other one, I'm not sure because these are kids in school. Um, so I do adults and children. So have a good one. And well, um, we're Ms. out I for now. Beard, you, didn't, yes? you didn't speak about um, the, the training that you offer. Um, I mean, the, the, the oh. show is about me, but um, I think <laughs> it would only be selfless. Um, self, it would be selfish of me if I didn't I'll ask you to bring to the fray the fact that you offer certain kinds of services that if um, yeah. there is an uh, individual who's budding in that area, they can find your expertise and um, available because I intend to get yeah. into the class so that I can become more yeah. um, competent and learn yeah. in the whole business of writing because I want to take it to its end, to the top. So if, yes, thank you, Bonnie. If you have a need for writing, whether it's editing, you want to understand your writing yourself, some of the ins and outs, hacks and tricks, 
I can offer that in an editing service. As Kumapi Tree Books Editing Service, I'll probably put a link. I don't have a link at my fingertips right now. Um, I find myself editing people's books. You know, if you have a book and you're not certain about the content and where it's going, I can offer to give you an insight into that. I, I do Zoom meetings and I'll talk you through your work or just listen to your thoughts if that's what you need. Writing is a very lone, can be a very lonely process. So if you want an accountability partner and someone to write with, your humble servant. I write, I try to write every day as a practice, 30 minutes, first thing in, in the morning. Um, and I can teach you more about that practice. Some people want to know how to write. Well, I'll tell you for, for, for nothing at all. To write, you gotta write. That's it. <laughs> you gotta write. There's, you can buy tons of books not going to help you so but if you want some guidance and some empowerment or even to write your book from start to finish I can help you do that so yes my email is there Pauline F. Baird at hotmail.com and I put my my whatsapp number there as well yeah so at any time I work with two or three people and that's about the math all right Take care and have a wonderful day, evening. Until next time, this is Book It with Pauline Baird and Marlies Harris Simon. Later for you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. So Marlies can turn off the um Yeah, the I'm recording. stopping the yeah, I'm stopping the live.